The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. lead worship for us. Actually, he's here uh, in the States because his daughter, Grace, of course, is getting medical treatment, and so we're blessed. We get the, the benefit of their being here, so thankful that their daughter is getting the treatment that she needs. She has an amangioma. Maybe you uh, knew that from when they were here before, but we're blessed to have Jacob. And we're going to have uh, a missions night coming up uh, in early December. And so Jacob will be hosting, and we're going to talk about our missions. And uh, we got to meet uh, one of our other missionaries a couple weeks ago. In fact, we're going to meet another one of our missionaries on Sunday. Uh, Ray Curran and his wife from Russia are here. And uh, so we'll get their blessing uh, as well. And we're just excited for uh, how the Lord is allowing us to be used of the Lord in missions in various different places and very excited about how the Lord is opening doors for us in Africa and uh, Jacob and Noel, and uh, just making a great difference. We're so blessed, and uh, blessed by their heart for the Lord, and now we get to enjoy them for a while as well. All right, would you all take your Bibles in uh, 1 Samuel, picking it up right in 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 3. Let's pray as we look to the Lord this evening for a blessing on His Word. Father, thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you that you pour out your life, your wisdom, the treasures of heaven in your Word. And we pray that, Lord, you'd pour out your, the Spirit of life. Lord, let the Holy Spirit just be poured out upon your church. For we come tonight with a hunger for your Word. We have a thirst for your Word. We have a desire for your Word. So, Lord, we pray that tonight you, by your Spirit, would just minister your life through your Word in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, we were studying, of course, here about Samuel. His mother dedicated him uh, because she was barren. The Lord answered her prayer to have a child. And so Samuel was born and became a mighty prophet and uh, a mighty man of God. And so uh, he, we see then his ministry developing here in 1 Samuel chapter 7. What had happened was the Philistines... Uh, they were headquartered in southwest, kind of in the Gaza Strip. If you look at a map today, go to the Gaza Strip. That would be uh, Philistine territory all along the coast there. And they were really oppressing. And, uh, and in fact, they had made Israel so uh, in, in their subject that Israel was crying out, you know, what do we do? What do we do? And they were desperate. And at one point, someone had a very foolish idea that they were going to go and they were going to get the ark of God, the ark of God, and bring it into the battle and, and, and thought that perhaps this would be, you know, they, they really looked at it like uh, an icon, as it were. Rather than the understanding of God's presence, they looked to the thing rather than to the Lord. And there's a great mistake. Whenever you look to the thing rather than to the Lord, then there is the possibility of grave error. And this is what happened. They brought it into the Philistine camp thinking, or into the camp of Israel as they faced the Philistines, thinking that it would charge up their men. Well, it did do that. But it also charged up their enemies, for they said, uh, you know, the, the God of Israel is the one who defeated Egypt. Now, do you want that to happen to you men? Now, buck up, you know, and let's fight or we're going to get defeated. And they ended up defeating Israel and took the ark uh, of the covenant. And so it was a, a bad day, and Israel started to mourn. And, and uh, well, the thing was interesting was when they took the ark of the covenant into the temple of Dagon, that was the Philistine God, uh, they, they set it up next to a, a, an idol, uh, a, a, you know, of Dagon, and the next morning Dagon had fallen on his face before the Ark of the Covenant, which I thought was interesting. So they thought, well, now that's uh, strange, uh, you know, why did that fall down? And so they put it back up, and the next day they came and not only had the, the Dagon God fallen, but this time his 
head had been severed along with his hands. And uh, so they're, now we're really thinking there's something wrong here. And so then they, they, they started to move the Ark of the Covenant around from city to city amongst the Philistine territory. And wherever it went, tumors broke out, and there was an infestation of mice. And so this plague went around. They finally decided, we better get rid of this thing. So they send it back to Israel. And that's really what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 7. It goes back, but they're mourning. They're mourning. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 7, 7 verse 3, Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, if you return to the Lord your God with all of your heart and remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve Him and Him alone, He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So here now you see Samuel arising as a prophet, calling these people to set aside all those gods that they had mixed with their own God. And there's a real problem. When you mix the world with God, it doesn't mix well at all. God doesn't like to be mixed with the world. And so what they discovered was that the hand of blessing was not with them, but rather the hand of discipline. God disciplines those whom He loves. And so he continued to discipline Israel until they would turn their hearts completely towards him. And here's Samuel the prophet calling them, you know, to repent. So the sons of Israel did it. They removed the Baals and the Ashtaroth and served the Lord alone. And if you knew what was involved in the Ashtaroth, you know, it's just, you look at this and you say, well, I don't, it's just a word. But if you knew the history of it and all that it meant, it would be vile. To think for a moment that that could be added to God would be a tremendous blasphemy to Him. And so when they got rid of the Baals and the Ashtaroth, it was a good thing. And verse 5, Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. And they gathered to Mizpah and drew water, poured it out before the Lord, fasted on that day. And they said, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines, there were five of them, went up against Israel. When the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Then the sons of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry to the Lord our God for us. What I like is when they said the Lord our God. Don't cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day. In other words, a tremendous thunderstorm had come in, and it says it confused the camp of the Philistines. And a thunderstorm can be uh, just the, the storm itself can rain confusion. Uh, you know, if you've ever been really near, I mean really close to a thunderstorm, uh, it, it'll just shake the boots right off your feet. I mean, it is a tremendously scary thing. And it confused them. So they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them, as far, struck them down as far as beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone. And he set it between Mizpah and Shen, and he named it Ebenezer. Now, you've no doubt heard the name Ebenezer. In fact, it's in some of the hymns that we see. But here's the root for it. Here's where it comes from. And its meaning is, thus far, the Lord has helped us. They set up this stone as a memorial, and they they were saying, God has helped. God has brought us this far. Now, I love that message. God has brought us this far. How don't you ever stop back and look at your life? And it's good to do this sometimes. Stop and look at your life and realize how God has sustained you, how God has blessed you, how, you, how He has brought you to this point. I don't know how long you've been with the Lord or how long you've walked with the Lord, but I hope that you've walked with the Lord long enough that you have a history. And if not, then 
Praise God that you can walk with him and you will have a history for you will see that the hand of the Lord surely is with those who are his sons and his daughter. And by the way, if you name the name of Jesus Christ, you're under the blood, then you are a son or a daughter of the Lord by adoption. He is now your father. You are his child. And there he loves you like a father loves his child. Whether you are a son or a daughter, he loves you with the intimacy of his heart. And so therefore, you will walk with him and he will walk with you no matter what comes. He did not say that you will not have storms. He did not say that you won't have difficulty. What he did say was that he would be with you through every storm, through every difficulty, through every trial, through every, uh, every difficult tribulation that comes. He will be with you through it all. And then you look back on your life, and then you realize one day, God has been good to me. So far. Now, why, why does they, they say so far? Because if he's brought me this far, he's not going to leave me now. He's going to continue to walk with me. If he's brought me this far, he's going to continue bringing me, and he's going to bring me all the way home. And therefore, I know that whatever I've entrusted to him, he will see to it that it is completed to the end. And there is that great history. In fact, when, when any Jew wanted to make a really good speech, I mean a really good speech, that Jew would start from the beginning and he would recount all the marvelous things that God did for Israel. Let's go back over it, shall we? And then you start going through all the marvelous things. Was it not God's hand of faithfulness? Was it not God's hands of faithfulness? Was it not God's hands of faithfulness? And therefore, the conclusion is, if he's brought us this far, he's not going to leave us now. And so I love that Ebenezer. He's brought us this far. He's helped us, and he'll stay with us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come anymore within the border of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistine all the days of Samuel. And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even to Gath. And Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. So there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Now, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he used to go annually on the circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah. And he judged Israel in all of these places. So, to judge Israel meant that the judge was a deliverer, but also one who would settle difficulties and disputes, and so he would go around and, and basically hold court, and people with difficult cases would come for judgment. And so that was also uh, one of the things that he did. Then his return was to Ramah, for his house was there. And there he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord, chapter 8. Now it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judge over Israel. I mean, we went from Samuel being young to being old in just a couple of chapters. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel or Joel, which means God is, uh, or the Lord is God. And the name of his second was uh, Abia or Avia, name of my granddaughter. They were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Now, that's a tragedy. You think, well, these are Samuel's sons. I mean, these are Samuel's sons. And so it really is a sad thing. Now, at this point, Samuel is old, and he no longer... Uh, you know, he's not raising his children, but he has authority over them. But nevertheless, these are his sons, and they go after dishonest gain, and they take bribes, and they perverted justice. It's just a tragedy. And so it says, then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations." But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. 
Like all the deeds which they have done since the day I brought them up from Egypt even to this day. In that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure or the custom of the king who will reign over them. In other words, they need to be warned in advance what it means to have a king, someone to reign over them. So he describes it. Notice in verse 10. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the procedure or the custom of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties, and some to do his plowing, and some to do his reaping of harvest, and some to make his weapons of war, and the equipment for his chariots. In other words, he's going to set up a government, and you're going to have to pay for it. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants, and he will take a tenth of your seed and a tenth of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. In other words, he's going to tax you. This is going to be a federal tax. And this is really what he's telling you. There's going to have to be a federal tax uh, in order that, you know, we pay for the kingdom. You want to have a king, he's going to have to have a government. He's going to have a government, he's going to have to tax you. And it's going to be as large as 10%. To which they all said, wow, 10%? How could we ever afford a 10% tax? Now we long for the days when there was a 10% tax. You know, I remember when, I, when we were in, in Russia, our first ministry over there, uh, they, they said, we heard, it, it, these are Russians, we heard that you guys have a lot of taxes. Is that true? And uh, I said, well, there are qu quite a few taxes, but, you know, we get benefit. I'm trying to defend the thing, you know. And uh, I said, well, you guys pay a lot of taxes? You know, we, we do pay a lot of taxes. And I said, well, uh, what rate? They said 90%. 90%? I said, are you serious? And he said, yes. I said, well, and no wonder we can't get this economy started. I mean, at 90%. So then I looked back at our tax rate, and I thought, well, that's not so bad. <laughs> then we look at this 10%, and they thought that was a lot. You will take your male, or he will take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. In other words, you're not going back. Nevertheless, <clears throat> the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we may be like the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now, see, there's something wrong with that right there. We want someone to fight our battles for us. You know, do you ever want someone to just fight your battles? You know, just, I don't want stress. I don't want difficult. Let somebody else fight my battles. Wouldn't that be marvelous? Do you ever look to the Lord to do that? Lord, you fight my battles. Well, it, you know, the, the Lord does say that the victory is ours when the battle is the Lord's. There is something to be said for trusting in the Lord, for His strength and His sustenance and the fact that He goes before us. There is something to be said. For understanding that when we rely on the Lord, that He walks with us in every way. And that He even tells us how to walk through a fire. That if we walk by the character of the Lord, if we walk by the grace of the Lord, if we walk by the, the, the forgiveness of the Lord, if we walk by the kindness of the Lord, by the patience of the Lord, that we see the blessing of the Lord with us through every conflict. We all have conflicts. But can we have conflicts in a godly way? That's what he wants for us. So he goes and says, Now after Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing, verse 22. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to their voice, appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city, 
and this the king will unfold, chapter 9. Now we're introduced to how the king, the first king, is going to be discovered, chapter 9, verse 1. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bukorath, the son of Athia, the son of Benjamin, a mighty man of valor. So it tells us that his father was a good man, a good man with a good heart, a man of valor. That's a good thing to have a father who's a good man with a good heart, who's led well, who's given a good example. What a great advantage is that. And really what you're going to see is that God does provide for Saul the advantage of leading. All the advantages that he needs, he's been given. Notice what comes. It says in verse 2, He had a son whose name was Saul. Now he was a choice and handsome man. In fact, there was not a more handsome person than he among the sons of Israel. And from his shoulders and up, he was taller than any of the people. So God is going to find someone like whom they want. He is going to provide someone like whom they would desire. I'm going to give you a king that you would vote for. Someone who's good looking. And uh, you know, it is true that politicians who are good looking seem to have better advantage. Those that are tall seem to have a better advantage. And there's something about that. We, 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 I don't know exactly what it is, but we, we like men or women who are, you know, good looking. And so it tells us that he was not only good looking, he was the handsomest guy in all of Israel. And so, you know, that's a great qualification for leadership right there. Handsome more than any other guy in, the whole, in all of Israel. And he's taller. I mean, those are good qualifications. He's tall also. Now, it says in verse 3, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish and his son Saul, or Kish said to his son Saul, take now with you one of your servants and arise, go search for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, passed through the land of Salishah, and they do not find them. Then they passed through the land of Sha'alim, but they were not there. So then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them there. Then they came to the land of Zaph, and finally Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let's return for our father. Cease, he'll, be, uh, he'll cease to be concerned about the donkeys and become anxious for us. And he said to him, Behold now, there is a man of God in the city, and the man is held in honor. All that he says surely comes true. Now let's go there. Perhaps he can tell us about our journey on which we have set out. Then Saul said to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is gone from our sack. There is no present to give to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have in my hand a fourth of a shekel of silver. We would say that a quarter of silver. And I will give it to the man of God and he will tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he used to say, Come, let's go to the seer. For he who was called a prophet now was formerly called a seer. Explains that. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let's go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the slope of the city, they found young women going out to draw water. And they said to them, Is the seer here? And they answered, them and said, He is. See, he's ahead of you. Hurry now, for he has come into the city today, for the people have a sacrifice on the high place today. As soon as you enter the city, you'll find him before he goes up to the high place to eat, for the people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now, therefore, go up, for you will find him at once. So they went to the city, and as they came into the city, behold, Samuel was coming out toward them to go up to the high place. Now, a day before Saul's coming, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel, saying this, About this time tomorrow I will send you a young man, or a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. And he will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have regarded my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul... The Lord said to him, Behold, the man of whom I spoke to you, this one shall rule over my people. Now let's stop just for a moment and look at what's happened. 
<clears throat> you can see from the story that the Lord is sovereign over